Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking about the Doctor Who episode, The Power of Three. Overall, I thought this was a reasonably decent episode, but there's um there's some there's some real some real questions that I have about this episode in terms of what's going on with the story. But um before we get into all of that First of all, one of the things that, in, I mean, in my book, kind of is a little bit of a strike against this episode, and I, I know I'm probably being absolutely ridiculously petty in, the, in regards to this, but I don't like the title. Uh, the Power of Three, for some reason, reminds me of that show, Charmed. And, um, you know, I've never really watched it, but I have an intense distaste for pretty much anything associated with Aaron's spelling. So that alone kind of made me uh, put off by that series. That and then there was also a girl I used to know who, because, and let me, I, I basically said I didn't like the show and she held a grudge against me for this for two years. Seriously. <clears throat> I, you know what, I'm just going to leave it at that. Somebody I know held a petty grudge against me for two years because I said I didn't like Charm. So, uh, again, I know I'm being very silly about that, but uh, you know that that that's how I feel. So uh, let's let's start talking about some of the interesting aspects of the show. We actually have some rather interesting guest stars this time around, but they're folks who are probably not going to be too familiar to the international audience. I'm sure a lot of you probably guessed that that uh, fellow Brian Cox, the scientist, is an actual scientist in real life. He's apparently uh, something, you know, one of those kind of celebrity scientists. I guess he's probably better known in the UK than he is where I'm from in the States. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of got a kick out of that. I like that Doctor Who is doing things like that. Makes it seem um, a little bit more grounded in the world that we live in. And there is also apparently a guest star who I'm going to assume is probably not well known outside the UK. And that is a fellow by the name of Lord Sugar. And uh, despite having a name that makes him sound like an extraordinarily flamboyant pimp from the time of Henry VIII, this guy is actually apparently uh, the host of the British version of The Apprentice. He was the guy who was berating some poor fellow, who I believe is actually one of the producers, for not being able to go out and sell some of the cubes. So, you know, I kind of had a feeling that he uh, he was also some kind of a British celebrity, but um, I had to go and uh, check uh, Wikipedia to determine exact just exactly who he was. So, you know, I'm sure I'm sure the British audience got uh, got a kick out of this. Uh, but anyway, so one thing that we have in this episode is uh, in the Stephen Moffat era, the first time we really get to see Unit, and. Um, Okay, I really wish they'd spell it out for me. UNIT is the United Nations Intelligence Task Force. So, presumably, UNIT is drawing from on people from all over the world. Now, I really wish they'd just spell it out for me as to whether or not UNIT is officially headquartered in the UK. Because it seems like the British branch of these guys seem to have the power to do whatever the heck they want. Of course, this power is granted solely by the fact that this is a British TV show. Just sort of, and, you know, it is sort of the long-standing Doctor Who tradition that, for whatever reason, the aliens always attack the UK first. But, you know, seriously, of course, in uh, American TV shows, the aliens always attack America first. In Japanese TV shows, the aliens always attack Tokyo first. I'm sure in Austrian television shows, Vienna is this, you know, prime choice for alien invasions. So, again, I really can't hold that as a mark against the show. It's just the nature of, you know, you have an initial home audience and then you have your audience abroad and you have to appeal to the home audience first. You know, that's not a mark against the show. But uh, I just sort of wish they'd offer us some you know, some justification for why everything involving UNIT seems to be centered in the UK. You know, seriously, just say UNIT is like the world headquarters, the world headquarters of UNIT is in the UK. I mean, 
Granted, the world headquarters of the United Nations is in New York, but seriously, one line of dialogue will do would do a long way towards justifying all this stuff that we see the, the UK branch of unit being able to do. But anyway, we're also introduced to the character of Kate Stewart, or Kate Lethbridge Stewart, and of course the daughter of the Doctor's old companion, the Brigadier, which is quite fitting since this really does feel very much like a John Pertwee sort of story. So sort of dipping back and going for a touchstone for the Third Doctor era in a story like this, it is really good. And, of course, you know, when, when Doctor Who came back, one of the things that I know a lot of fans were asking, one of the things they really wanted to see was, you know, we want to see the Brigadier one more time. Because, you know, the Brigadier is a very, very beloved character among old-timey Who fans. But, uh, of course, it was stated uh, in the previous series that uh, the Brigadier had passed away. Which, you know, naturally hit the Doctor pretty hard, seeing as how, one, he wasn't there by the side of someone who is one of, genuinely one of the Doctor's oldest and truest friends. On Earth, anyway. So, here we have Kate, the Brigadier's daughter, and it's interesting, she's She's really sort of like what hap would happen if they let uh, the Doctor's old companion, Liz Shaw, have the Brigadier's job. Now, Liz, if you're not really familiar with the early 70s who was the Doctor, third Doctor's, essentially the third Doctor's first companion. She was a really uh, smart scientist who worked for UNIT. And um, so, so I'm kind of glad that they didn't just make um, Kate, you know, a carbon copy of her dad. She's someone who, you know, obviously has that uh, Lethbridge Stewart spirit, but she has her own approach to things. And honestly, I, that's definitely the the way to go. If she'd just been some, you know, younger female version of the Brigadier, really, she'd have just been an extraordinarily shallow character. And honestly, if you're going to do something like that, I can think of better ways to handle the situation. Uh, honestly, though, I'm just sort of curious if there, ever, if um, who Kate's mother is is of any real consequence. Uh, it's been a really long time since I've seen a John Pertwee episode, so I really can't say if there was any mention made as to whether or not the Brigadier was married. Um, I don't think there was, but you know, don't quote me on that. But I have the feeling that at the moment, seeing as how Kate's just been introduced, it's probably something immaterial. So, let me see here. What else? Uh, looking over here at my notes. Uh, wow, I guess I should have taken more detailed notes because I don't remember what, exactly what some of these things mean. But anyway, let's uh, move on. Uh, speaking of shout-outs to Old School Who, we see ref we don't see them on screen, but the, doc the 11th Doctor has apparently gotten to have another uh, throwdown with the Zygons who, in my opinion, were actually some of the best-looking monsters from the early 70s Doctor Who episodes. There was some real some real effort was made in those monster suits, and they still actually look pretty cool and creepy to this day. So, let me see here. Ah, yes, yes. Um, it's brought up by Brian. Uh, Brian, as in Rory's dad, not Brian Cox, the guest scientist. Um, he asks the doctor about whether or not any of his companions have died. And of course, the answer to that is yes. Now, how many of um, the companions have died is really going to depend a lot on exactly who you count as a, uh, as a true companion. Like, uh, for example, the character uh, from David Tennant's run, Astrid. Uh, a lot of people se seem to count her as a companion. I don't exactly, and it's not because I disliked the character. I thought Astrid was a really nice character. But to me, a companion is someone who has shared, mul sh shared multiple adventures with the Doctor. Now, the Brigadier never really traveled around with the Doctor and the TARDIS, but he and the Doctor had many adventures together. So I, I'm cool with calling the Brigadier a companion. Astrid, uh, you know, she had that one really nice episode where she died at the end. You know, sorry. Uh, now, the, also the question is, do machines count as companions? Because both Chameleon, the fifth Doctor's companion, and the third version of K-9 were also destroyed. Um, 
I don't really count K9 because K9, you know, just came back as a different version of himself. Chameleon, um, I, I guess he counts, but, you know, he, he's just not somebody that I was ever really terribly attached to. But okay, I'll, I'll grant Chameleon. Now, the two characters that pretty much everybody agrees that were companions and who obviously died are the first Doctor's companion, Katrina, Katarina, ugh. and of course the most famous Doctor Who companion, Death, the fifth and fourth and fifth Doctor's companion, Adric. Now, I, I kind of, I'm a little reluctant to say this, but I understand why so many people hate on Adric, but I kind of have a little bit of a soft spot for the character, partially just because of the fact that so many people hate him, but I also like the fact that. When he and the Doctor were traveling together, I, I like those scenes where you where we get to see the Doctor mentoring someone, a young person. It's like what he did with Susan, what, what he did with Adric, what he did with Nyssa. What he we all what he also did with Ace. And, you know who doesn't love Ace? She's awesome. So that's one aspect of Adric that I liked, and I also liked the fact that you know, as much of a jerk as Adric was, he did die. You know, he did die doing something very brave, and his death did have a very serious impact on the Fifth Doctor. It was a really much-needed reminder to us that the Doctor's adventures are dangerous, and not just to himself, and not just to the random guest stars for that episode. It was that needed reminder that the companions themselves are not safe, that the bad guys can sometimes win and that the characters that we really care about can die. And, uh, boy, we've seen plenty of that in the new new Doctor Who and on Torchwood and all that other fun stuff. So I do think that Adric's death really did serve a genuine purpose, and that's part of why Earthshock is one of my favorite uh, Fifth Doctor stories. Uh, let's see. Now, what's uh, some of the other stuff from this episode? Okay, I, I won't lie. I got a very big kick out of watching the Doctor, you know, screw around with a Wii and, uh, you know, that little bit of a shout-out to Saturday Night Fever. Um, I'm not so wild about the idea that the Doctor is has, like, this insanely short attention span. You know, that the Doctor can't just chill out for a little while. I mean... The way Matt Smith was acting, you'd think the Doctor couldn't, like, sit down and read a book for an hour without going crazy. So, I have to say, I think in terms of the writing and the characterization of the Doctor, in this regard, that this was a little bit of a misstep. Now, let's get into some more of the uh, nuts and bolts of the actual episode. Now, I do like the core idea of the slow invasion. The idea of all these cubes appearing out of nowhere... You know, it's obviously something really crazy is going on, but nobody can figure it out. And months and months go by, nobody understands what's happening. And, you know, it is very, it is very, a very good way to build that tension. You know, you're sitting there, if you're like me, watching this, and like, what do these things do? What is their purpose? What is going to happen when these things open up? And, of course, when they do open up, well, even then, we don't get a clear answer they, because they all do something. So this is a very, in this that regard, this episode is really, really smart. You know, you're really kept guessing as to what's going on here. Uh, now, as for the actual bad guys here. Okay, the pest controllers of the universe. Well, okay, it's, it's always kind of cool when the Doctor mentions, well, you know, these are stories of that we used to tell the frightened little Gallifreyan children at night, because, you know, he's gone there before with stuff. But the, here's the thing. We're never given any explanation at all as to why humanity is a threat. Now, unless these aliens have access to time travel technology, which, as I understand it, they probably shouldn't have, because, it's you know, in the Doctor Who universe, the aliens that race species that can travel in time are pretty limited. Why do they consider humans such a threat? I mean, we've barely we've set foot on our moon. That's it. That's in terms of what we've done in terms of going to other planets. And honestly, 
we're all at least in the Doctor universe, like constantly being invaded by aliens. You know, why don't these guys just help out one of the other alien species that wants to destroy us? And look, look at them. They're not actually trying to wipe humanity out. They're just trying to thin our ranks. They're trying to basically no way, I might be wrong on that. They did say that they were going for a second stage. So yeah, I guess the first step was, okay, we've wiped out a third of them. Let's go and try and wipe out another huge chunk of them. So, okay, I guess I was wrong on that one. But again, there's there's no reason. At this point in our technological development, humans are really only a threat to ourselves. So why do these guys want to destroy us? And speaking of why, why were they kidnapping those people at the hospital? And, you know, presumably those other people. Seriously, there is no explanation ever given as to why they're taking those people. And why do they keep them alive? Why do they keep Rory alive? I mean, if their their thing is exterminating the human race, why are they keeping some of us around? I mean, are they going to take these, you know, figure like, okay, well, we've exterminated only, almost all of humanity, but we're going to hold on to like a dozen of these guys and go sell them to the interplanetary zoo. I mean, really, seriously, what the heck? Uh, okay. And um, speaking of stuff that doesn't make sense, look, uh, I'm no doctor, but uh, I did take first aid in college, and I know that if somebody's having a heart attack, that that you know, just not it's not just the their heart isn't being that would kill them. It's also the whole thing of oxygen not getting to their brain. So those people were apparently out of it for quite a while. So now, granted, it was mentioned that a lot of these people were going to have to go to hospitals. They weren't 100% okay. But shouldn't a whole bunch of people still died or, at the very least, a lot of people woken up with severe brain damage? But no, we get another case of the magic defibrillators, you know, that we see all the time on TV where if you zap somebody... With a defibrillator, they'll get up and, you know, they're like, oh, 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 no, no, I'm okay now. I can, you know, I was almost dead a second ago, but, man, I just needed some electricity right into my heart to be fine. You know, sorry, folks, if you're in a condition where you need a defibrillator, even if they do bring you back, you are going to be in some rough shape and need to go to the hospital for a while. Now, I won't lie, I did get a big kick out of uh, the doctor's heart attack at the unit base, but... Again, that's a top secret, you know, high tech government laboratory. Surely they have some defibrillators sitting around for medical emergencies. I mean, for God's sakes, they have defibrillators in the subway in case of medical emergencies, at least if they do where I live. So you're really going to tell me that the high, the, you know, the secret headquarters of a major international organization doesn't even keep the decently stocked uh, medical supplies? <sighs> okay, so we also get to have a really nice little conversation with Amy and the doctor, and it does do a, a nice job of kind of addressing the question of why the doctor keeps coming on back to Amy and Rory, except for the fact that the doctor has never really displayed any major attachment to his companions, other companions, who were there when he regenerated. Now remember, the first person that the doctor, the, the fifth, the sixth doctor saw after he regenerated was Perry, and he tried to strangle her to death. And, uh, the, you know, the fifth doctor, he never seemed to display any particular attachment, you know, after, after, you know, any huge, any particular attachment to Adric and Nyssa and Tegan. I mean, Tegan left the TARDIS of her own free will because she was immensely freaked out. If, you know, the Doctor had imprinted on those three like he apparently should have, if you believe what the, the 11th Doctor is saying, then, you know, wouldn't he have, uh, you know, gone chasing after Tegan to bring her back and have more adventures with her? With him? He didn't do that to her, as far as we know. Certainly, there's no evidence he did that with Nyssa. And God only knows whatever really happened to Perry. I mean, it's never been made 100% clear. And boy, isn't that some of the biggest BS in the entire history of Doctor Who. Now, I guess you could also say that maybe this is something that's just unique to the 11th Doctor. 
Okay, well, why doesn't he just say so? You know, I, I mean, some real explanation is needed here. Uh, now, I do... Well, let's, um, in terms of, uh, what's going on with Amy and Rory, I thought this was actually a pretty decent episode for them. A lot better than A Town Called Mercy. Here we get to see, you know, Amy and Rory really trying to have their cake and eat it, too. And, you know, really, who can blame them? I mean, you know, wanting your cake and eat, being able to eat it, too, that's the natural human tendency. But it's also interesting to see them kind of acknowledge that as great as the doctor's traveling with the doctor is, having a normal life, you know, being able to go to friends' weddings, being able to plan things month and months in advance, being able to have a full-time career, you know, those are all things that give give our lives very, very real meaning. And as much fun as, you know, gallivanting around the universe, getting into crazy situations and helping to save the galaxy is, eh, at the end of the day, it is also a natural human tendency to to want to enjoy the things that ordinary life has to offer. And obviously this is something that's going to come to a head this season. How's it going to go? Well, I don't know. But I can't help but think, Amy and Rory have been given so many opportunities to just kind of walk off into the sunset happily. But it hasn't happened. So either something seriously dramatic is going to have to make them happen to ha make them have that choice, or maybe Amy and Rory aren't going to get a happy ending. Uh, now, before I wrap this up, there's one more thing that's kind of puzzling. Actually, there's a little bit more I did want to talk about. First of all, I, I, I'm, I just found it weird that people are constantly going to want to have these little black cubes around. I mean, after the novelty wears off, aren't most people just going to toss this stuff in the dump in the trash? You know, if they'd said that there was some sort of mildly addictive or property or some sort of low-level psychic field around these things that makes makes them makes people want to keep them around okay then I could buy that but if you look at the way these things are they're placed in places that would obviously be ridiculously inconvenient as a part of ordinary life and you know people generally do not tolerate things that are ridiculously inconvenient in their ordinary life if they don't have to, especially if it is something as simple as pick that thing up and throw it in the freaking trash. <sighs> and also, wow, isn't it convenient that one of the uh, linchpins of the whole A invasion plot apparently decided to spend months and months hanging out unnoticed in the form of a child in a hospital rating room where Rory just happens to work? Now, look, I know hospitals are busy, busy places, but I think if a kid is sitting in a hospital waiting room for months on end, eventually somebody is going to notice. You know, I mean, look, I, I I have family that's... My stepmom used to work in hospitals, and man, oh man, I've heard a few horror stories about um, what ha things that have happened because of staff members not paying attention. But still, nobody is that inattentive. And, you know, I, again, really? It just happens to be Rory's Hospital? Now, okay, again, I know. I, I review comic books all comic book shows all the time where absolutely ridiculous coincidences are kind of the norm. And, again, absolutely ridiculous coincidences are not exactly new in Doctor Who either. But, again, I, I just don't feel I'd be doing my job as a reviewer if I didn't point out just how really absurd that is. I mean... It even wouldn't have been so bad if they said that, yes, this absolutely must happen. This, you know, this location absolutely must be used. There, this plan will not succeed if we do not have one of our little robot people there. Because if that isn't the case, why didn't they just, you know, have one of these little robot people go out into the woods somewhere? In fact, why bother with a robot that looks like a person at all? You could probably just make up something that looks like you know, a high-tech TV antenna and stick it on the roof of uh, a building somewhere. Well, actually, you know, somebody would notice that eventually. But you could just stick that out in the woods somewhere. Or, hey, here's an idea. Bury it in the woods somewhere. And nobody would probably ever notice. But that's all I have to say for this episode, folks. As always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, take care and have a good one.